Good morning. That's all right. Good morning. Much better. I just want to, I want to do this because it's such a unique, awesome uh, kind of space. Let's just hear from the top kind of folks up there. I bet you you can beat the bottom folks in terms of noise, both from location, air superiority, and from volume. So good morning upstairs. Oh, they kicked your butts, I got to tell you. Yes, it's true. Uh, we are doppelgangers. Uh, it's kind of strange. Uh, I told Nate if I start to stink, just jump up here and take over for me, and no one will know the difference. Um, that wasn't by choice. He was actually wearing a black T-shirt and blue jeans, but Birkenstocks and socks. Uh-uh, I don't roll like that. It's a big difference. My name is Jeremiah. Uh, thank you so much for being here this morning. What an amazing place to be. Do you realize we're on water right now? And that right behind here, there's a bunch of guys dressed in suits uh, working on the U.S. Coast Guard ship. It's pretty amazing. I was kind of watching and observing what was happening there. Right behind you is the USS Midway, a warship that you can tour with uh, your own audio headset. Um, and water and donuts and, and an amazing venue. Uh, I like to start by just saying, you know, one of the hardest things to do, at least for me, is to recognize where you are when you're there. And so recognizing where you are right now in this incredible community, in the midst of, of friends, both old and in the future, that we're here together, not over some common enemy, not because we have some sort of skin in the game, we're here together because we made that choice this morning, um, and, and I'm excited about it. So thank you for making that choice. Thank you for your generosity in listening to what I have to say. Um, and I hope that it will provide some value for you. I also want to say there are no experts in any of this stuff when it comes to startups and creativity and all those things. None of us are experts. We're all figuring our shit out. So I'm not an expert. I hope something that I say this morning will resonate with you. If it does, take it, remix it, use it, steal it, do whatever you want to do with it. If it doesn't, it's okay. We don't have to divide over it. It's all good. So thank you, Nate, for being here. San Diego Startup Week, this is my fifth event. Um, so pretty amazing, uh, a little coarse, so I apologize if I cough a little bit. Uh, and I want to do something unique. This is totally about me. It's not about you. I'm sorry. I'm just going to do it. Uh, it's very rare that I'm in the same city uh, as my wife uh, and giving a talk. It's very rare that if I'm in the same city with my wife at the same time that she gets to come and be a part of it. So, Jesse, will you please stand up? I just want to say thank you. I love you. Um, thank you for your unyielding support. So the art and science of value creation. In 1984, a San Diego resident living in La Jolla published a book with Random House amidst the backdrop of the Cold War. The Cold War was escalating arms race between the United States and Russia. And he chose to, to add some commentary to the geopolitical situation that was happening in the world. Fear was rampant. A term called mutually assured destruction was on the rise. The Iron Curtain was real. And a San Diego resident decided to say something about it. And in 1984, he came out with what I think is a groundbreaking book full of knowledge called The Butter Battle Book. <laughs> Dr. Seuss. I just found out, actually, that he preferred to be called... Dr. Seuss, like noise. Do you know that? No idea. Dr. Seuss published the Butter Battle Book in 1984, wherein he tells the story of two different people. One, the Ukes. And the Ukes are common people, normal, peaceful people. And they happen to believe that when you eat toast, you butter your bread, butter side up. And the Zooks, those dastardly Zooks, who again, peaceful, calm people, amazing people, who happen to believe that you butter your bread, butter side down. Now, the story goes on about how the Ukes and the Zooks at one point decide that that divide between them, butter side up and butter side down, warrants building a massive wall between their two lands. So they create this wall. And then it, they go on to escalate into small arms race. 
So the Ukes decide they want to defend the wall, their side of the wall. So they create a weapon and they show up at the wall. And lo and behold, the Zooks have met them there with exactly what the counter would be. So they go back to their camps. They design another weapon. They design another weapon. They meet back at the wall. Oh, they've countered each other. And it escalates and escalates and escalates and escalates to a point where all of a sudden there's one bomb. And both of them are standing on the wall ready to drop that bomb onto the other side. Mutually assured destruction. Incredible commentary at the time. Controversial. Well, I guess a little bit. It got banned in Canada. I don't know if that counts. Uh, Somewhat controversial. But relatively easy story to understand what was happening. And although that was back in 1984, and although that was Dr. Seuss, I think it has some wisdom for us today. And that there might be this idea of a divide. When I was asked to talk about what's broken in our community, I was kind of discouraged. I don't think we're broken. I think we're thriving. I think we're healthy. I think our startup community is amazing. I've been able to be a part of it for years, be able to meet with incredible founders doing incredible things. I came from the creative world. I started my own agency. Our creative community is thriving. And so when you ask the question what's broken, it's very hard for me to get to a place to say something is broken and point at it. But I think this story has some wisdom in us when we start to understand that perhaps there's an ideological divide. You see, the Zooks and the Zooks weren't fighting over land or power. They weren't fighting over politics. They were fighting over an ideological divide. And in our creative world and in our tech startup world, there may be the perception of a divide. And it might look like this. On one side, perhaps we have the Ukes, the creatives. And on the other side, perhaps we have the Zooks, the coders. In fact, there are full-on events that pit creatives versus coders, designers versus technologists, founders versus people that lead with them. So on one side, we call something design thinking. I practice design thinking. And on the other side of that ideological wall, we say, no, I'm a lean lean startup. Maybe we say, uh, oh, I prototype. I say, no, 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 it's not called prototype. It's called an MVP, minimum viable product. Well, it's about customer inspiration. No, no, it's about customer development. Well, A-B split testing. No, it's about experimentation. And although it sounds ridiculous, I've been party to, meaning observing, heated, faith-based debates about which camp is right and which one works and which one doesn't. I've been part, party to by observing people crossing their arms and creating a chasm between one another based on ideology. And I contend to you today that if anything is broken in our community, It's the perception that we're not after the same thing. That the startup community and the creative community aren't one and the same. We're actually in this together. And the reason I believe that is because both of us deeply desire, deeply work, deeply care about creating impact in the world. Deeply care about the value that we provide and create for our customers or for our clients. And to that point, when we divide ourselves along ideological dogmas, we miss the bigger picture of value. I contend that value trumps dogma every single time. Our ability to create value for our community, our ability to create value for our state, and for our country, and for our world, is more important than the dogma with which we believe we get there. So this morning, I I wanna make an argument that to create value, we actually need both. That it's both art, and it's both science. It's both inspiration, and it's rigor. These are the things that lead to impact in the world These are the things that lead to creating value in the world. And as a community in San Diego, a 
of creatives and technologists as a community unified by our pursuit of value, we have to start talking about the fact that we're one and the same. And so instead of focusing on what's broken, I want to focus instead on three traits that I've seen in all of my work of great value creators. creators. And at the end of this, I'm going to challenge you to make a choice. To make the choice to become a value creator. To put that at the center of your DNA as a creative. To put that at the center of your DNA as a founder or as a technologist. That we as a city and as a community can become great value creators. And the first of these traits is that great value creators are ambitious learners. Now, I want to qualify this just a little bit. By learning, I don't just mean traditional ways of learning. Great value creators understand that the greatest source of learning is not around a boardroom table. It's not in a co-working space. It's not even in a book. When it comes to value creation, the greatest source of learning is actually direct and intentional interaction with the customer. What that means is that great value creators lead with empathy. They put on the weight of their customers. Maybe not literally, although this is pretty funny. We had a baby a year ago. I, we is not the right term. My wife had a baby a year ago. I happened to be there. I can never actually have empathy for what she went through. I can't. It's impossible, physically impossible. But I can attempt to understand and to walk in her shoes. Great value creators lead with empathy. They try to personally experience their customer's perspective. And they want to see what people really do, not just what they say. This is where surveys and focus groups fall short. If I ask most of you in the room this morning, I love this example from Malcolm. That if I asked most of you in the room this morning about the coffee, and I said, well, what do you prefer in your coffee? A, a light roast, a medium roast, or, or a dark, rich, bold roast? Most of you, like most of America, would say dark, rich, bold. Give me, give me the coffee. Give me the dark stuff on the bottom, right? And I can believe you. I say, okay, I'm going to go roast some really strong, rich coffee. That's, of course, that's what the customer said. I've got to go do it. But if you sit in Starbucks for five minutes and you observe the person that orders their dark, rich, bold coffee, what's the next thing they do? Anybody? They turn around and they pour a big, a big thing of cream in there, right? And then they rip open their sugar packet, Splenda, Stevia, whatever it is, sweetener, and dump it in, stir it up, and go, ah, what do they really like? What do they do? Sweet, milky coffee. It's the truth. Guess who knows that? Starbucks. The last thing they sell you is coffee. The first thing, sugar, and the second thing's milk, right, or cream. And so when we're able to personally experience, we lead with empathy. We choose to be empathetic. It's vulnerable. It's a vulnerable choice. But when we choose to do that, we experience life as a customer. We separate what customers say from what they actually do. And guess what? We're all customers. And what we say and what we do are two different things. It's not because we're liars. It's because we're human beings. One of the companies, and I know it's sellout to corporate America. I accept it already. Uh, I know I'm walking through the gift shop. All they want me to do is buy something. And I do, and I know it. But I still love them. Uh, there's a near and dear place in my heart for Disney and Disneyland. But I love this story that Walt Disney, probably one of the greatest value creators, at least in modern time, tells about the initial development of Disneyland. Disney went to a bunch of different theme parks. In fact, the World Fair and all sorts of you know, uh, different county fairs and different ideas that he had. He wanted to go out and get empathy for that experience. So he went out to the fair, and he's walking around, and he observes that there is garbage just everywhere around. And he goes, I, I don't understand why people are so lazy. They just throw their trash on the ground. Like, gosh, these people are terrible, right? And he could have said, you know what? I'm Walt Disney. I'm going to go out and send a survey to all the fair directors in the land 
and ask them, why is there trash on your ground? Or I'm going to hire a force to walk around and pick up all the trash. Or I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to open a park. I don't want trash all over the place. People are nasty. I'm going to wait until they stop throwing their garbage on the ground. No. Disney instead went to the concession stand. He ordered himself a hot dog and a little thing of popcorn. And he proceeded to walk around, eating his hot dog, eating his popcorn. And he finished. There he is, holding his wrapper in, in a box. And he goes, where's the trash can? So he goes on this journey to find a trash can. He's looking around, he's looking around. And it's a profuse journey. It's pretty long. He can't find one. Finally, he finds one. He's able to throw it in. And he looks around and he goes, aha. The reason that this looks like Charlotte's Web, <laughs> you know, Templeton running around singing his smorgasbord song about the fair, is that there's no trash cans. And so instead, he steps back, and he starts to observe people that go to the concession stand and walk away. And what he finds is people were willing to carry their trash about 15 steps, 30 feet. And so even today at Disneyland, that's starting to pour over into cities, into the way that we design public spaces, you will not go 15 steps without a trash can. It might look nice. It might be hidden right, from view, but it's 15 steps in Disneyland. It's 15 steps in Disney World. It's 15 steps in everything that they do. The only way Walt gains that insight is through empathy, putting on the weight, making the vulnerable choice to be amidst, amongst the people and understand it. So great value creators understand that empathy is the foundation for their work, and they also understand that empathy starts with one. And if I could challenge you with one thing today to do, today, not tomorrow, next week, is who do you need to gain more empathy for? I speak around the world at different conferences, startups, marketing, creative, all over the place. And every time there's one slide that everyone goes, oh, and the cameras come out and all that. Not from me, from other folks, which is their marketing stack or all the logos that get up there and all their research. And we attempt to solve for everybody. So there's a one size solution, I'm it, solve for everybody. And I contend to you instead that there is no more powerful tool in your toolbox if you are gonna be a great value creator than a cup of coffee with a customer. There's no more powerful tool than sitting down face to face and choosing to understand, asking about them, not talking about you. Empathy is the foundation of value creation. And great value creators understand that. The second trait I've observed is that great value creators are boundless explorers. They choose to go out and explore the unknown, to be boundless in that exploration. And the way that I think about this is that it's really the difference between search and execute. The truth is, if you're attempting to create new value, or use this word innovation, right? Innovation is kind of a suitcase word. We pack a bunch of meaning into it. I think innovation means attempting to discover and create and deliver new value for our customers, right? That's how I think about it as far as the definition. When we venture out into value creation, into trying to do something that hasn't been done before, we are inherently operating in the dark. We're inherently operating in the unknown. No one's done this before. So all of the market trends, all of the best practices, all of the dogma goes away. Because it doesn't apply here because it's never been done before. And great value creators understand that they're involved in a search. They're in a big dark room. And the best they can hope for is to light a small candle where their next step should be. That's what value creation is about. That's what it means to do something new. And the truth is you can't execute your way to value discovery because it's inherently unknown. If you're in a startup where you're trying to do something no, new, I say this to founders often. I hope you hear it this morning. It's okay to be wrong. In fact, it's expected. If you're right all the time, you're probably not doing something very new. How many of you have ever written a business plan? Anybody in the room? Congratulations, you're fiction writers, just like myself. 
We can't predict the future. So therefore, we must search our way through it. Therefore, we must continually learn and be boundless in our exploration. This is Chris. He's the founder of a company called Betabrand. Anybody wear some Betabrand stuff or know of them? Anybody? No? Okay, a few. Cool. Betabrand is probably one of the fastest growing uh, startups in the Bay Area. Anyone can guess what they do? Clothes. No technology involved. Clothes. And Chris set off, their original product was called the Quarter Round. It was a pair of corduroys you could roll up and ride your bike around with. And what he was learning from his audience in his search was that, oh my gosh, people really enjoy kind of playing with the fact that, you know, aha, I'm wearing corduroys, but they're really bike pants. Like, it's kind of fun for them, right? And so he said, you know, traditionally, what do you do if you start a clothing company? Well, you design a bunch of clothes, a line, right? And, and you go out and source all your materials and you sew them up and you make them and all this stuff, you invest a bunch of money. And then you try to get like really skinny people to wear your clothes and walk down you know, small aisles up and down. And you hope that a bunch of people take photos of that. And as they take photos of it, you hope somebody else sees it and goes, we want that. And then you just scale and have a warehouse. And that's the traditional route that you'd go if you're starting a clothing line. Chris said, yeah, I don't think that's we're that type of company. And so he decided, I want to go crazy. I think people want to play. I want to create clothes that are crazy. And so let's start with like a disco ball jacket, which he's sporting here. It's, you know, sequency jacket, all disco ball. Let's see if that'll work. He threw it up on a website and said, we're not going to make a damn thing until it gets funded. People want it, we'll make it. If they don't, cool. Off it goes. It's funded. He learns, okay, that's cool. Well, what about like a, you know, a smoking jacket, but it's reversible? So one side is, you know, all business. It's kind of like a mullet in a jacket, right? It's all, it's all business here, and then you flip it out, and then it's crazy and fun on the other side. I happen to own one. I love it. Um, let's create Create that. And people find that, oh my gosh, people liked it. And they want different colors. Oh, I know, we'll do a bacon t-shirt. It'll be like a big bacon, and then it'll flap open, and no one, no one bought that one. <laughs> and they took it off the shelf, right? The point is he's learning his way through how people would actually respond to this. He didn't go out and get the models and the skinny people to walk down the aisles. He went directly to his customer. He searched his way through it. It's an incredible story. All the way to the point where people started flooding his inbox with photos of them in crazy situations wearing Beta Brand's clothes. And he decided, you know what? These are our model citizens. These are the folks we want to admire. And to this day, Chris has never hired a model to wear his stuff. Beta Brand has never hired a model or paid an agency to shoot the photos. It's been user-generated crazy things and up on the, on the homepage, and that advertises stuff. It's learning your way through value creation. It's learning your way through the unknown. The truth is, operating in the unknown looks a lot like this. We try something, and it doesn't work. And it's not about failure, by the way. Little side caveat rant. It's not about failing fast. It's actually about learning fast, right? We have to learn. If we fail, we learn. It's okay. If we succeed, we learn. Learning is the fundamental unit of success for any new venture. And so we attempt new things. We put ourselves out there. We try to learn. We measure tightly the evidence that we're producing. We might measure tightly what we think is going to happen. Go back to grammar school, Bunsen burners and pocket protectors. If we do X, what are we going to do? Y percent of people will do Z. Right? It's that simple. What do we think people will do? How many do we think will do it? What are we going to do to get them to do it? That's how we search. It's not just bumbling around in the dark. It's asking where is the next step. Great value creators are boundless in their exploration and understand they're operating in the unknown. And finally, great value creators are resolute scientists. Now, I'm, I feel like I'm a little bit of a nomad of your community. Uh, I wrote a book that I thought was for you, or not for you personally, but for our community. Turns out it wasn't. Every single person I talked to in the creative industry said, that'll never work, or we already do this. And I said, no, -uh, you don't. And so I felt like a nomad. I felt like I got kicked out of the creative community. I felt like the minute I said rigor, out I went. And I've been traveling around going, oh, man, 
If only they knew I love them, but they think that I was actually at a huge AIG event, AIGA event, giving a talk. Half the crowd, literally half the crowd, loved me, came up to me, talked to me. It's like, oh, it makes so much sense. The other half were like, well, what's your definition of design? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? That dogma came out. And so when I say that great value creators are scientists, I'm not saying that they're not creative. I'm saying that they understand that to create new value, they have to follow the evidence. It's not about the ideas. Ideas are cheap. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Execution is actually even not that hard. It's producing the evidence that's difficult when it comes to creating new value. And following that evidence is even more hard because you fall in love with your idea. So many new ventures die because their ideas or solutions searching for a problem. And no one has it. And I contend to you instead that value creators are scientists. They follow the evidence. And the value path looks like this. We identify assumptions. And every idea you have, there are a set of assumptions hanging underneath it about what your customers will do and what behavior changes they'll make. If we're able to identify those, we stop arguing around a table, and we say, guess what? I can go and prove that assumption true or false. Let's do something to prove ourselves either true or false. And once we do that, we then create some evidence. And we can make a decision about what we're going to do next based on that evidence. And guess what? This has to happen at speed. It's not about two years worth of your idea marinating. It's about what can you do right now? Three questions. What don't I know about the idea? What's unknown to me? Number two, what can I do right now to start learning? And number three, how will I measure those results? What don't I know? What can I do now? How will I measure the results? That's the value path. Great value creators understand that it's not just about the idea. It's about discovering and producing evidence along that journey. James Dyson considered one of the, our modern great inventors, tells a story about the 5,127 attempts he made at creating value. And I love it because he says, you know, at, at attempt number 1,200, our third child was born. At attempt 2,500, uh, we were really pinching some pennies at that point. At attempt 4,000, my wife had to go and tar- start to teach art lessons because we didn't have any money, right? Because I hadn't discovered where the value is. But he continued and continued. And at iteration number 5,127, the DC01 was born. What an incredible journey of discovering and producing evidence about what does create value and what doesn't 5,127 times, which has led to incredible things. The DC01 has led to new fans. I travel a lot. You can't go past an airport without, that's sweet, right? And maybe we've saved a ton of trees. I don't know. And we've killed a bunch of electricity. I have no idea which one's better. I'm not here to make a value judgment about that. It's led to washing machines. It's led to all sorts of things. Because he continually assumed he was wrong. Not assumed that he was right. And that's the difference. If you're going to follow the evidence, you can't predict the future. You can't write a business plan and say, oh, all I have to do is execute upon this. If you have ever successfully, 100%, predicted the future, stand up right now, get out of here because you shouldn't be here. There's a job for you. It's called soothsayer. And you'll make lots of money if you're right. But I know I'm not that, so I assume I'm wrong. I assume that I need to learn my way through value creation. I assume that I have to try something, learn, and produce evidence. Oh, skipped ahead. So instead of assuming you're right and executing upon what you believe is true between your ears, you start by assuming you're wrong and triangulate your way to discovering where value is. So great value creators are learners. They choose to learn and practice empathy. Great value creators are explorers. They head out into the unknown willingly. 
And they understand that it's a dark, cavernous space, but they're lighting candles along the way. And great value creators are scientists. They follow the evidence, not the truth that they believe in their head. And so I have a challenge for you today. I told you I was going to make that challenge. And that's this. Just like the Ukes and the Zooks developed their big wall, it's like they created weapons to throw against one another. Just like they had their ideological divide, ultimately what they had done is they had created and set up camp. They had stopped exploring, they had stopped learning, they had stopped following the evidence. So I want to challenge you today as someone that wants to create new value, as someone that wants to create impact in the world, to leave the safety of camp, leave it behind. And choose to head out into the unknown. To practice empathy deeply for your customers. To give a shit about what you're doing for them, not for you. To head out and explore the unknown and search. To head out and produce evidence that what you're doing actually creates impact. To leave the safety of camp. To leave the dogma behind. And instead choose to become a value creator. Imagine if all of us in this room decided today that we were going to go out and practice deep empathy for somebody else. And based on that empathy, we were able to discover a problem they had and try to solve that. And imagine if we triangulated our way through that, the impact we'd have on this community, the impact we'd have on our city, the impact we'd have on our state in our country, and in our world. Great value creators leave camp and make that vulnerable, amazing choice. So thank you so much for your time. I'm Jeremiah Gardner. That literally is my email address. If I can help you in any way, shape, or form, I'd love to grab co- you by the coffee, bold, rich, dark, and then I'll pour cream and sugar in it. And I'd love to talk to you about what you're working on. Thank you so much.